Good afternoon. I'm Mark Greenfield. As chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I'd like to welcome you to another program in our noon lecture series. Today's guest is a noted historian, a gifted author, and a respected former presidential advisor. Professor Schlesinger is not only a Harvard graduate, but holds the dual distinction of being a Phi Beta Kappa Democrat and currently as a writer and educator has won numerous awards in both of these fields. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Prof Professor Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Thank you. I didn't know that being a Phi Beta Kappa and a Democrat was such a particular rare distinction. I assumed that all Phi Beta Kappas were Democrats. <laughs> I thought I might say a few words today as an historian about a term and a concept which, have been, which are much discussed today when we discuss the foreign policy of the United States, and that is imperialism. Imperialism is a highly charged word, but what I propose this noon is a fairly academic discussion I want, as an historian, to try to find out what imperialism means or what it has been said to mean, and to discuss in what sense American foreign policy, now or for many years in the past, can be said to be imperialistic. The word imperialism is derived, of course, from the word empire, and then there is hardly, there's nothing new about empires, especially to a world like ours formed legally and culturally by the Roman Empire. An empire is a, the, represents the domination of a group of states or peoples by a single power. And I suppose that the creation of empires began on this planet sometime soon after the domestication of the horse. In the more modern sense of domination by a developed state, of areas in less developed parts of the world. The greatest phase of European imperialism, European expansionism, took place in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. None of this phase of the expansion of Europe produced much speculation about causes or motives. It evidently all seemed entirely natural at the time. And then, of course, in the late 18th century, the early 19th century, many of the colonies established in this first wave of expansion, especially, for example, those in the Western Hemisphere, won their independence, and for a time there was a lapse in European interest in acquiring new colonies. It was during this period of lapse that the word, that imperialism as a word seems to have made its first appearance. It was apparently first used in the 1840s in France and was introduced into English uh, in the 1850s in the commentaries on the regime established in France by Louis Napoleon with the Second Empire of Napoleon III. Since then, according to the meticulous and exhaustive work on the subject by Richard Kerbner and H.D. Schmidt, attempts to a biography of imperialism as a political word. Imperialism has changed its meaning uh, no less than a dozen times. What gave it its most common contemporary meaning was the revival of interest in overseas empires among the European states in the second half of the 19th century. This, what appeared to be a renewal of empire building in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, seemed to present new problems and to generate a new need for explanation. The result was a debate, a debate which has continued, still going on today, on the nature of imperialism in the sense of the effort of developed states to extend their hegemony over parts of the underdeveloped world. Obviously, any effort to summarize this debate in a few moments is bound to be sketchy and in inadequate. Yet it would be useful, I think, if we're going to see to in what extent 
American foreign policy can be described as imperialistic, but it would be useful to have in mind the broad range of theories purporting to explain the mainsprings of the imperialist impulse. The first kind of theory to be examined, I suppose, might be that the kinds of theories offered by those who supported and benefited uh, from imperialism. How did the, what did the imperialists themselves think they were doing, or at least what did they say they thought they were doing? This category of explanation can be called in a very general way, and all these categories are going to be very broad and not allow for nuance. Uh, this first category can be called the missionary explanation of imperialism. Uh, the Europeans, uh, the explanation ex uh, set forth by those Europeans who felt that they were, they were, they were carrying out a civilizing mission to the un tutored and undeveloped world. This was, in Kipling's phrase, the white man's burden. It was the duty to carry the benefits of Western culture and Western technology to the far corners of the world, to modernize the traditional, to develop the undeveloped. It's fashionable today to deride and dismiss such motives, and there's no question that they very often served as the cloak for much uglier desires and aspirations. Yet it would be wrong, I think, not to acknowledge a certain reality in, in this conception. Uh, such motives, the belief in the civilizing mission, led thousands of Westerners to spend their lives in obscure and primitive corners of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, from the British local commissioners of the 19th century to the Peace Corps today. This explanation of imperialism is obviously self-serving, but it is one, as I say, which has at least a partial validity in the lives and devotion of many quite decent men and women. Historians have even argued that the main backing for imperialism, at least in Britain and the United States, came from people who were progressive on the issues of their own country, people who were interested in reform at home, men like Joseph Chamberlain in England and Theodore Roosevelt in the United States. And the main opposition to imperialism in Britain and the United States in the, uh, around the turn of the century came precisely from those who were most reactionary in the, their treatment of the uh, policy in the domestic community. In any case, the idea of the civilizing mission was a significant part of imperialism, and the success of that mission is ironically demonstrated by the fact that so many of the colonial revolutions against European rulers have been car carried out in the name of the very values of freedom, self-determination, and social justice that these rulers taught them, values which often existed in clearer and stronger form uh, among the colonizers than they had previously in the countries colonized. It has been said that the British Empire was destroyed in Sandhurst and the London School of Economics, meaning by the Africans and Asians who were educated in those institutions, two institutions which taught a generation of colonists how to think, act, and fight for themselves. Yet however valid the idea of the civilizing mission may be as part of the story of imperialism, it is obviously not the whole story. Many Contemporaries declined to take the imperialists at their own valuation. They sought what, what they thought believed to be the real motives underneath this facade of humanitarian and religious concern. And there thus arose rather quickly various economic explanations of imperialism. The first important work setting forth the economic interpretation was, of course, a book by J.A. Hobson called Imperialism in 1902. His argument was carried, for, carried forward by a couple of Marxists, Rudolf Hilferding, in his book on Finance Capital in 1910, and it was, of course, given its sharpest polemic, polemical emphasis, as well as the stamp of historical inevitability by Lenin in his work of 1916, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. These writers, most of whom derive uh, from Hobson, though they pressed his arguments in, in and other directions. These writers argued that 
the imperialist impulse was inherent in the economic structure of capitalism, that at a certain stage, capitalism, in order uh, to survive in its present form, had to embark on the imperialist course. The writers differed among themselves about the mechanism of this and about its inevitability. Uh, Hobson argued that what appeared to be domestic overproduction, at least in terms of the capacity of the domestic market to absorb the industrial surplus, was led to a search for colonial markets and investment outlets, as well as assurance of access to raw materials. But Hobson was arguing for uh, making this argument about imperialism, not because he thought it was an inevitable expression of capitalism, but to bring about reforms in the allocation of resources in the, in the native country. But it was appeared to be overproduction, he said, was actually under consumption. If a larger measure of buying power or went to the working classes, then imperialism would be unnecessary. The Marxist writers uh, put their particular emphasis on the search for investment outlets, which they believed to be required by finance capitalism. But even here, Hilferding saw, saw imperialism as a policy which capitalist countries chose to pursue. It was Lenin, who, above all, who saw it as a necessity, as an inescapable stage in capitalist development, as a phase uh, which no capitalist country could escape. In any case, regardless of these uh, varying emphases, all these writers agreed that the economic surplus produced by capitalism, whether a surplus of goods or a surplus of capital, led capitalist nations to take the imperialist road, that imperialism, in other words, sprang from the pressure on, on the state by the great capitalist interests determined to use the state to enlarge their own economic power and profits. This is a sense in which the word is very commonly used today, but there are still other views of imperialism which we should note before we attempt to see to what extent uh, these views apply to the policy of the United States. The next type, to be put against the economic interpretation of imperialism, the next type to be considered might be called the sociological theories of imperialism, where the economic approach explained imperialism as something determined by private economic interests. The sociological approach tended to explain it in terms of the social structure of the expansionist states. The first significant work written partly in response to Lenin was by the Austrian, later American economist, Joseph Schumpeter, called Imperialism and Social Classes, written in 1919. Schumpeter denied Lenin's proposition that imperialism was specifically a capitalist phenomenon. There had been imperialism, he pointed out, long before there had been uh, capitalism. And in Schumpeter's view, imperialism was actually contrary to the inner ethos of, of capitalism. Imperialism represented, in his view, the survival in modern society of an obsolete feudal militaristic mentality devoted to conquest for its own sake without specific objective or, or limit. It served the purpose of this outworn warrior psychology and values. It represented men who had no fun can find no functions for themselves in the rash economic rationalism of capitalism. It would, in Schumpeter's views, inevitably yield before the rationalist, prudential, bourgeois spirit of, of modern business society. Another sociological explanation came from Hannah Arendt in her book, 1951, Origins of Totalitarianism. She saw imperialism arising in this period as a rather desperate answer to the internal divisions and demoralization of the 19th century na nation state. Merging somewhat the economic explanation with the sociological, she diagnosed imperialism as the product of superfluous money and superfluous men the result of an alliance between mob and capital. The passion for expansion appeared as a lifesaver by providing a common interest for the nation as a whole. Economic motives, in her view, were largely a pretext. The real reason was the effort to escape the impending sense of social disintegration. In the term Richard Hofstadter used in applying somewhat this theory to American imperialism to resolve a psychic crisis 
uh, which was threatening and disturbing the nation. And still one more type of theory about imperialism must be mentioned, and that is the political strategic view that saw imperialism not as a result of the, not as an expression of the needs of the private, of the economic structure, nor an expression of the needs of the social structure, but rather as a execution of certain necessities, political and strategic, of the state itself. This view was expounded at the time of the expansionist fever, especially by two American writers who had much more influence abroad than at home, A.T. Mahan and Brooks Adams. And writers like Mahan and Adams argued the emphasize the importance of holding and enlarging lines of communication and other strategic points in order to preserve national vitality and power. In their view, economic motives, reasons were clearly subordinate to reasons of state. That it was not up to the state to follow the needs of business, but up to business to do what the state required for its own preservation and power. Building on hints derived from these writers, later historians and political scientists have developed to a more elaborate degree what might be called this political strategic interpretation of imperialism. This school is not represented by any major theoretical text comparable to Hobson or Lenin or Schumpeter, but it has been developed by writers like the historians W.L. Langer and A.J.P. Taylor, the political scientist Hans Morgenthau and others, and their general point is that political factors are far more crucial than economic or sociological factors in the revival of imperialism at the last part of the 19th century. Hans Morgenthau, for example, has placed particular emphasis on the inexorable temptation to expand when a powerful and dynamic state confronts a vacuum of power. He emphasizes the role played by the existence of weak states or of politically empty spaces which are attractive and accessible to a strong state. The economic historian David Landis traces the dynamics of imperialism to the instability of any relationship of unequal power. Power, like nature, abhors a vacuum, and imperialism is simply the multifarious response to a common opportunity that consists in the disparity of power. And so the contrast between the technological energy and dynamism of the West and the its Faustian drive to remold and master in comparison of that with the stagnation of the underdeveloped world made expansion inevitable. Other writers in this school saw imperialism less as a result of the general pressures among states than as a response to a particular historical situation in Europe at the end of the 19th century. Someone like the great historian of Europe, W.R. Langer, saw the renewal of imperialism in the late 19th century as largely a reflection of European power politics, reflecting the problems of Europe itself during a period when the alliance system had produced a temporary deadlock within Europe, where, no longer, where it was impossible for European states to compete with each other within Europe without threatening major war, and then therefore the search for national power and prestige had to take place beyond the frontiers of the European continent. Colonies, therefore, became assets in the struggle for power, in the competition for power and prestige among the European states, and imperialism, in this view, could best be seen as the extension into the periphery of the political struggle of Europe. The development of this political strategic view also brought about a re-examination of the economic view, of the view that imperialism was largely the result of the, uh, of the search for new markets, for, ex for supplies of raw material, or for investment outlets. When one looked at the actual statistics, it did not appear in the view of the, those committed to the political and strategic view that the economic interpretation worked out. The economic role of the colonies, it was pointed out, was marginal and had remained marginal from the viewpoint of trade and of investment. Far from being great sources of investment or great sources of trade, uh, the colonies, and particularly above all the colonies gained in the period of the 70s, 80s, and 90s of the last century uh, were on the whole uh, not uh, very lucrative. They were not great investment outlets. They were not great trading outlets. 
the great powers at all times invested more money and traded more with other great powers than they ever did with colonies. In 1913, for example, Britain had more money invested in the United States than it had in any colony. In this period, less than a third of Britain's exports went to the empire and less than a half of British investment was in the empire. When the United States undertook its colonial drive in 1898 and after, far from being a country with a capital surplus, with capital seeking new outlets for investment, the United States was a, a debtor nation, which was a nation, in other words, importing uh, rather than exporting capital. In the 1930s, such expansionist nations as Italy and Japan uh, were nations poor in capital. And the passion for expansion came from the military and official classes in these nations, not from the bankers and the uh, investors or the traders. This did not, this critique of the economic interpretation did not mean to imply an absence of cruel economic exploitation often accompanying uh, the, the acquisition of colonies for other reasons. It re questioned rather whether the economic exploitation was the motive, whether it had, and whether it had more than marginal importance for the metropolitan economies, however much it might enrich indiv individuals. This then is a rather cursory review of the leading <coughs> theories of imperialism. You will note that the concept of imperialism derives primarily from the experience of European expansion into the underdeveloped world. The leading theories of imperialism rose to, pri to explain European actions, relationships, and behavior. What I want to consider now is the extent to which these classical theories of imperialism apply or illuminate, uh, apply to or illuminate the rise of the United States as a great imperial power. Expansion of the United States began, of course, within the American, North American continent. The faith in the manifest destiny of the United States, which led to the steady drive across the continent and to the acquisition of territory from the Indians, the French, the Spaniards, the Mexicans. This can be readily understood, perhaps, in terms of the disparity of power between an energetic, modern, ambitious people pressing continually on great empty spaces inhabited by, largely by wandering and relatively primitive nomads. The real question begins, I suppose, with the emergence of the United States as a world power at the time of the Spanish-American War. This question has led to a prolonged historical debate, a debate with profound and, and with very obviously contemporary implications. One side of the debate represented by writers like William Appleman Williams, Gabriel Kalko, Noam Chomsky, and others, argues that American foreign policy for at least three quarters of the century has been steadily devoted to the quest for world political and economic hegemony in the interests of the pro private profits of American business. And some of these writers are certain, gener in addition, that expansion and aggression, that this course of expansion and aggression were the inevitable result of the needs and aspirations of American capitalism. The policy of the open door, Williams writes, was designed to clear the way to establish the conditions under which America's preponderant economic power would extend the American system throughout the world. In each case, the objectives were markets for American industrial exports, raw materials for American factories, and the right to enter directly into the economic life of a country by establishing factories and other enterprises. The economic expansion, William said, made it possible to exercise a growing influence on local political and economic decisions, served to provide a base for further penetration, and ultimately took on a military significance. And these writers contend that this policy, a policy of expansion in the interests of American capitalism, has dominated all American governments, all administrations, liberal as well as conservative, uh, Franklin Roosevelt just as, as, as much as uh, Hoover, um, Nixon just as much as, Kennedy just as much as Nixon. Indeed, according to this view, the reason we entered the Second World War was not because we thought that a Nazi victory would be harmful to America's security, but because we knew it would be a threat to the continued expansion 
of the economic power of American business. The other side of the debate, then on the question of the nature of American policy, has minimized the economic motives for American expansion. For example, the historian J.W. Pratt, in his book Expansionists of 1898, argued in a, in a closely documented monograph that the rise of the expansionist philosophy in the United States owed very little to economic influences, and that even the call for colonial markets and, and colonial investment outlets came not from businessmen and bankers and so on, but from intellectuals, journalists, and politicians. Many business leaders, Pratt shows, were opposed to or unenthusiastic about the war with Spain, and so on. As for the notion that American intervention in the Caribbean in the 20th century was dictated by banking and financial interests, this too has been challenged by historians who have sought to show that the commercial and financial intervention in the Caribbean came at the behest of the State Department fearful lest disorder in the Caribbean might invite European intervention and threaten American control of the Panama Canal. As Hans Morgenthau has summed up the argument, economic determinism as a guide to the understanding of American foreign policy was discredited long ago by case studies that showed the extent to which the so-called dollar diplomacy of the turn of the century, seemingly a typical example of a foreign policy doing the bidding of economic interests, was a political policy using economic interests for the political purposes of the state rather than the other way around. Nor is it easy for many people to accept the view that the American participation in the Second World War was to defend the commercial interests of American business. To accept that view, it is necessary to suppose that President Roosevelt engaged in bitter combat at home with the business community should be doing the bidding abroad of those very interests who were devoting all their energies to the destruction of his New Deal. All of this is, is to be noted, too, that most businessmen and bankers were opposed, contrary to the economic interpretation, were opposed to American intervention in the Second World War. Now, it should be noted that both these schools, the economic interpretation and those who place their emphasis on political and strategic factors, acknowledge the indisputable fact of American expansion in this century. The disagreement comes over the motives for this expansion, whether it has come about as a result of the pressures of American businessmen and the needs of American capitalism, or whether it has come about in the service of the real or supposed political and strategic interests of the American state. And I would like to examine this disagreement between the economic interpretation of American imperialism and the political and strategic interpretation in terms of two major current areas of American interest, that is, Latin America and East Asia. At first glance, Latin America would seem an excellent, indeed a classical example of the case that through thick and thin, United States foreign policy has been devoted to the promotion of the private interests of American business. We all know about the record through the years of the United Fruit Company and W.G. Grace and other firms doing business in Latin America. And the contention of those who take the economic view of uh, American foreign policy would, would be that even episodes like the good neighbor policy of Franklin Roosevelt or the Alliance for Progress of John F. Kennedy represented not departures from this policy of securing the economic interests of American business, but only more cunning and intelligent ways of pursuing the same end. And moreover, when one looks at the present figures, one comes away with a rather vivid impression of American direct investment in Latin America is more than $10 billion. At the same time, American private profits taken out of Latin America have been greater than American, the new American investment in Latin America by a larger figure every year since 1962. In 1968, by the quite formidable figure of eight, over $800 million. In some years, private remittances to the United States have exceeded public aid dispersed under the Alliance for Progress. Uh, between 1961 and 19, the middle of the decade, Latin America received about $6 billion in loan and investment, but paid back double that sum 
in debt repayment, interest on loans, and remitted repatriated profits. So that clearly, in spite of all the righteousness with which we sometimes feel that we have been giving American taxpayers money to aid the Latin Americans, it is clear that during throughout the 1960s we have been taking more money out of Latin America than we have been putting into Amer Latin America, whether by aid or for investment. It raises the question, who has been giving aid to whom? Yet while it would be rash to deny that private investors and private firms doing business in Latin America have influenced U.S. Latin American policy, it would perhaps be equally rash to explain all U.S. policy toward Latin America by American capitalists, capitalism's demands for markets or for investment outlets. A glance at the statistics makes it very clear, for example, that there is no one-to-one -one relationship between the size of private investment and the extent of political control. Of U.S. private investment in Latin America, more than a quarter is in the single country of Venezuela, more than half is in the three countries of Venezuela, Mexico, and Brazil, all states that have pursued courses relatively independent of the United States. One could add that U.S. private investment in Latin America is only about 60% of U.S. private investment in Canada or in Western Europe. So by the simplistic theory, U.S. political control should be far greater in Ottawa, London, and Paris uh, than it is in Caracas, Brasilia, and Mexico City. But can one really reduce all national interests to economic interests and suppose that the protection of private and promotion of private investment determine all foreign policy? Do not differences sometimes emerge between the private interests of U.S. business and the national interests of the United States? Was the good neighbor policy, for example, really no different from the policy of dollar diplomacy? One notes in a State Department memorandum in 1939, which makes the point succinctly discussing the behavior of U.S. petroleum companies in Venezuela. It must not be permitted them, this, department, this directive says, permitted them, the petroleum companies, to jeopardize our entire good neighbor policy through obstinacy and short-sightedness. Our national interests as a whole far outweigh those of the petroleum companies. This was U.S. Latin American policy under Roosevelt. And was so much the case that Eduardo Santos, the great liberal president of Colombia, once remarked, the honest, practical, good neighbor policy was so effective that where previously American companies were accustomed to threaten the government of Colombia by saying an appeal would be made to Washington, the picture was reversed, and it, is, it now was the government who made or threatened to make the appeals to Washington. Nor were American private interests any more enthusiastic about Kennedy's Alliance for Progress than they were about Roosevelt's good neighbor policy. I think a fair examination of the record suggests that the economic interests of U.S. corporations in Latin America have less influence and had less influence on policy than the security interests of the United States. And it must be frankly stated that when strategic interests are not important, the interests of U.S. business and the economic penetration of Latin America have often had a large and, in my view, invariably injurious influence on the formation of our policy in the hemisphere. But when the pursuit of profits for American business visibly threatens U.S. strategic and political interests, the economic motive takes second place. Even the Nixon administration has tacitly, tacitly acknowledged this in the controversies with Peru and Bolivia over the nationalization of American-owned oil interests, where the administration, of course, has failed to apply the punitive Hickenlooper Amendment cutting off all aid uh, in cases of expropriation without immediate and prompt negotiations for compensation. Proposition that political and strategic interests might have some priority over economic interests becomes self-evident if we were to imagine for a moment that the United States was not a capitalist democracy, but was indeed a communist state like the Soviet Union, and to ask in what ways a communist United States would behave differently in Latin America from a democratic United States. It is sometimes said, for example, that the United States sponsored the Bay of Pigs expedition in 1961, that it intervened in the Dominican Republic in 1964 to protest the, protect the interests of American sugar capitalists. But does anyone suppose that a communist United States would have acquiesced in the takeover 
of Cuba and the Dominican Republic by regimes deemed correctly, and as far as America was concerned in one instance, incorrectly in the other, but deemed in any case to be re ready to offer their countries as bases for extracontinental power, any more than the Soviet Union was ready to acquiesce in regimes it disliked in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Would a communist United States, for example, have permitted a great hostile extracontinental power to install nuclear, nuclear missiles in Cuba? Would not a communist United States been just as determined as a democratic United States to take the measures it considers necessary to protect its national security? And this is not said to justify American actions, but to suggest that they can be better understood in the context of the protection of national security than in the context of dollar diplomacy. Let us not make the mistake of ascribing to economic ambition but should be more fundamentally ascribed to strategic anxieties. Obviously, the United States has not opposed communism in Latin America just because it wished to protect the interests of American business. It has done so essentially because a communist state in Latin America might become a base for a nuclear threat against the United States, which was hardly a whimsical fear, as we learned in October 1962. Any administration in Washington, liberal or conservative, capitalist or communist, would be obligated to take necessary steps to protect the safety of the country. If we are to think clearly about the question of imperialism, it is essential to distinguish such raison d'etat from, say, the desire to promote foreign investment. The case of Latin America, far from vindicating the economic interpretation of imperialism, forces one, I think, to rather different uh, conclusions. It leads one to understand that certain basic security interests operate quite independently of the system of ideology or ownership, that it would lead, therefore, a communist state, if a communist United States, to many of the same actions uh, which have been taken by a democratic United States. I should add that I am drawing distinctions, not making value judgments, for we must clearly understand that the dominance of strategic interests creates problems of its own. For 20 years, the Pentagon has been busily negotiating bilateral defense pacts, dispatching military missions, offloading op obsolescent weapons, stimulating militarist appetites, training officers, and developing a whole network of private, independent relations with the military of Latin America. The special interests of the US military establishment may corrupt our corrupting hemisphere policy today quite as much as the special interests of US business corrupted hemisphere policy in the days of dollar, dollar diplomacy. If the economic interpretation is not altogether convincing as an explanation for the American role in Latin America, how well does it apply to the most gross and ghastly case of US intervention in our time in Vietnam? The attempt to count for the president, American presence in Vietnam in sort of Hobson-Lenin terms as a result of a quest for markets or investment outlets is hardly impressive. Our total investments in the entire Far East in 1965 amounted to about $2 billion, and of this, uh, more than a half was in petroleum, so, which there is no great amount in Vietnam. So taking that out, this represented something to be about, about one-tenth of our investment in, in uh, Latin America, one twelfth or fifteenth of our investment in Canada or in Western Europe. Obviously, we are not in Vietnam to protect or promote U.S. economic interests in that unfortunate country. The American government has already poured more money into Vietnam than American business could hope to get back in a century. Nor is it convincing to argue that we had to spend thirty dollars, thirty plus billion dollars a year uh, in Vietnam in order to preserve business profits at home. The effect of the Vietnam spending has been deleterious to the economy. It has overheated the, the economy, stimulated inflation, weakened uh, our balance of pay for even further, our balance of payments position, except for those firms specifically dependent on production for Vietnam. Uh, everyone would be happier if the war spending came to an end. A more sophisticated version of the economic thesis is that the United States must suppress revolution everywhere because if revolution succeeds in a country which has no great prospect for American investment, the contagion of revolutionary success 
may lead to revolutions in other countries with American investment. This, of course, is the Leninist version of the domino thesis. And writers like Gabriel Kalko are quite free to admit that they believe in the domino thesis. In this regard, Dean Rusk and the New Left are at one. As Kalko has put it, we must regard Vietnam as the inevitable cost of maintaining U.S. imperial power. What is at stake, he says, according to the domino theory with which Washington accurately perceives the world is the control of Vietnam's neighbors, Southeast Asia, and ultimately Latin America. Ultimately, Cockle says, the U.S. has fought in Vietnam with increasing intensity to extend its hegemony over the world community and to stop every form of revolutionary movement which refuses to accept the predominant role of the U.S. in the direction of the affairs of its nation. We must reject, Calco urges, the illusion of the accidental quality of the role of the U.S. in Vietnam. Any administration in Washington presumably would have been forced by the necessities of American capitalism to do precisely what the Johnson administration did in the years after 1965. This theory, though it has more plausibility than the <coughs> other version of the economic interpretation, overlooks, I think, the fact that U.S. policy in the third world, while it has been uniformly, fairly uniformly anti-communist, has been by no means uniformly anti-revolutionary, nor do the nationalist revolutions, which are most characteristic of our time, inevitably lead to communist rule. Quite the contrary. Actually, the communists have only come to power in three new nations in the last quarter century, in China and North Vietnam, because they put themselves at the head of, the, of nationalist movements during the Second World War, and in Cuba because Castro, for reasons of his own, <coughs> steered a nationalist revolution into the communist empire. The most common form of upheaval in the Third World is the nationalist, militarist, populist revolution, like Nasser in Egypt, Peru and Bolivia and Latin America offer, offer current expressions of this. And this is a form of upheaval determined to protect national independence against the Soviet Union and the United States alike. As for the United States, it has actually accepted, in some cases even supported, such revolutions in a number of countries in Asia, uh, Africa, and Latin America. I don't think the economic interpretation of imperialism explains the US presence in Vietnam nor do the other, most of the other classical theories work much better. Hannah Arendt's argument about the alliance between mob and capital does not apply here, as there was no great business passion for investment in Vietnam, so there was no surging popular clamor for military adventures there. Nor do the theories tracing imperialism to the instabilities and temptations created by disparities in power explain why there were 500,000 American troops in South Asia rather than, say, in Latin America. How then to explain Vietnam? I believe that we stumbled into Vietnam for a number of reasons. And as my time is drawing short, I will only say, indicate very sketchily what some of these reasons were. Partly it was because of the vacuums of power created in the post-war world and the tendency and the consequence of the only two existing powers, Russia and the United States, to clash in that vacuum, partly because of the uh, theology of anti-communism created by the Cold War, which, led, which made it very difficult for people to uh, accept the fact of any fragmentation or differentiation within the communist world, partly because of the misapplication of theories of collective security, the famous Munich analogy which led people to suppose that a threat to the peace in one place was a, was a threat everywhere. Still, I think all by themselves, all these various factors might not have, have uh, been enough to account uh, for the American intervention, American involvement in the war in Vietnam. Another factor, I believe, is required to press us forward into the irrational attempt to determine the destiny of a country in the mainland of Asia. And of all the classical theories of imperialism, the one that throws the most light on American behavior in these years, in my judgment, is that proposed by Schumpeter. Schumpeter, you remember, saw imperialism as the objectless dis disposition on the part of a state to unlimited forcible expansion, a disposition created and sustained 
by the habits and interests of a warrior class. There will always be sort of spurious, rational pretexts for military action, national security, trade, investments, and so on. But the essential urge, he said, would come from the sheer momentum of the military machine in motion. Schumpeter, as we've noted, thought that the progress of capitalism would steadily eliminate the warrior class, which he saw as a hangover from the martial habits and institutions of feudal, feudal times. But he omitted the possibility that war among capitalist states might produce a new warrior class, and therefore new forms of imperialism. And has not indeed something like this happened in the United States? The American, the abortive American imperialism at the turn of the century was a clear case of Schumpeterian atavism, a reversion to habits of the past. Men like Theodore Roosevelt, Lodge, Mahan, uh, as historians had celebrated the Federalist vision of the American role, and now as politicians hoped to redeem the commercial bourgeois society by giving it a martial purpose. But the neo-federalist impulse of the turn of the century, because it lacked a serious institutional base in American society, could not and did not last. Half a century later, however, two world wars had brought a great military establishment into existence, and the Cold War made it impermanent. Well, the United States already predisposed to foreign involvement by the misinterpretation of collective security, by the sense of an evangelical mission to the world, and in a sense, propelled into such involvement by the power vacuum of the post-war world, plus the quite genuine threat that the unitary communist movement of the age of Stalin posed for a time, the new warrior class became the agency for the militarization and enlargement of our interventionist policies. During the Cold War, the warrior caste has increasingly behind it the power of sheer momentum especially in a time when new military technologies, by making the United States vulnerable to attack from almost any spot on the planet, uh, gave the invocation of national security unlimited application. And when duty inevitably required the military of one nation to advocate constant growth <coughs> to forestall potential adversaries from gaining technological superiority. Created by wars that required it, Schumpeter wrote of the military establishment in ancient Egypt, the machine now created the wars it required. Schumpeter's account of Rome from the period, period from the Punic Wars to Augustus has an uncomfortable contemporary relevance. Here Schumpeter wrote is a classic example of that policy which pretends to aspire to peace but unerringly generates war the policy of continual preparation for war, the policy of meddlesome interventionism. There is no corner of the known world where some interest was not alleged to be in danger or under actual attack. If the interests were not Roman, then they were those of Rome's allies. And if Rome had no allies, then allies would be invented. When it was utterly impossible to contrive such an interest, why then it was a national honor that had been ins insulted. The fight was always invested with the air of legality. Rome was always attacked by evil-minded neighbors, always fighting for a breathing space. The whole world was pervaded by a host of enemies, and it was manifestly Rome's duty to guard against their unquestionably aggressive designs. In whatever sense America can be said to have become an imperial state, the active carriers of that imperialism are not our bankers or foreign investors or traders nor any of the conventional Leninist villains. The carriers are our politicians, diplomats, and most especially, our military leaders. The forward role of the military has been especially evident in Vietnam. First, they, require, they defined the problem as primarily a military problem requiring a military solution. And then at every step along the way, the generals have promised that just one more phase of military escalation would bring uh, the victory so long and so steadily, so long sought and so steadily denied. The Pentagon, in addition, has seen Vietnam as an invaluable training ground, testing ground for new weapons and new techniques of destruction, as well as a place by which ambitious men could get receive training and promotion. General Shoup, that, that, that Mari the Marine who was a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Kennedy administration, wrote recently, civilians can scarcely understand that many ambitious professionals truly yearn for war and the opportunities for glory and distinction afforded only in combat. 
As General Shoup has written, all the services in the case of Vietnam wanted a piece of the action and competed there for the opportunity to practice their trade. Here surely lies a major cause of our imperial drift, the incessant pressure of the professional military in an age of chronic crisis. The warrior group, because of its own internal needs and preoccupations, constantly demands more money, more weapon systems, more military involvement, more military intervention. Moreover, its members are always able to evoke the emotions of virility and patriotism to strengthen their case. Their importunities affect the way choices are defined and the atmosphere in which decisions are made. The pressure is especially effective in amorphous situations and with irresolute leaders. This is not, in my view, a problem of bureaucratic determinism. The warrior caste does not inevitably control U.S. policy, nor are the warriors evil men or war criminals. They are professional men trying to do a professional job and making exactly the arguments the nature of their profession requires. It is foolish to be surprised by the advice they give or to blame them for it. It is far more to the point to blame those civilian leaders who take their advice. <coughs> the real problem lies less in the existence of the military establishment than in the judgment and will of our civilian leadership. I would like to distinguish this point, the point I'm trying to make, from the talk about the military-industrial complex. For the concept of the military-industrial complex implies that the military are nothing but the agents and stooges of the business community and are only carrying out the bidding of the business leaders. Only old Leninists like Dwight D. Eisenhower could really believe that. <laughs> it hardly does justice to the role the military have acquired in the years since the Second World War. What we must understand is that the military are not the agents of the industrialists and the bankers. They have been thrown up in these years as an independent force, a force in their own right, with their own institutional base, their own economic base, and their own political base. And the policy, indeed, the policies that they urge, as the policies of military escalation in the later stages of Vietnam, are very often policies opposed by preponderant forces in the business community. At no point was the business community clamoring for the war in Vietnam, and in recent times, business leaders have become increasingly anti-military escalation. But the military themselves, who were the fathers of this war, have remained faithful to it. And their initiative, at a time and a time when presidents have been reluctant to overrule their recommendations or to disbelieve their assurances, has been, I believe, the essence of the American drift into imperialism. If this is so, it suggests that contemporary American imperialism is not rooted in a particular economic structure or system of ownership, and history indeed suggests that this is the fact. Every great power to, in the world today, whatever its ideology, whatever its system of ownership, has its warrior caste, and therefore every great power contains strong inner pressures toward imperialism. Consider the Soviet Union. If what so the Soviet Union did in Czechoslovakia was not imperialism, then the term has no meaning because this was clearly an act of un intolerable and unprovoked domination by a large state against a smaller state. As I say, if this was not imperialism, then the word is an empty word. But if it was imperialism, if it is imperialism, then the notion of imperialism as a phenomenon uniquely rooted in capitalism must be dismissed. Probability is that the Russian warrior caste, like the American warrior caste, are all operating precisely as Schumpeter described, the warriors of ancient Rome are mo trying to mold Soviet policy to their own purposes. And since Soviet leadership is as mediocre as our own, uh, are enjoying a measure of success. This, in short, it seems to me, is the essence of the problem of contemporary imperialism, whether in the Soviet Union or in the United States. And it is our particular task in the United States to bring our own imperialist impulses under control. According to the advocates of the economic approach, we cannot do so, we cannot end American imperialism without revolutionizing our economic system. In their view, so long as we remain a capitalist country, imperialism is inevitable. For this reason, nothing is accidental. We would have done what we have done in Vietnam, regardless of what man or party controlled in Washington. 
Yet surely the example of the Soviet Union makes one doubt whether an abolition of capitalism, a transformation of the economic system would affect the impulses toward imperialism, for the abolition of capitalism would leave untouched the role of the military establishment in a time of high technology and incessant crisis. The U.S. might have pursued much the same policy in Southeast Asia if it had been a, a communist state just as the, as the Soviet Union is, it, though, not, though not a capitalist state is pursuing interventionist policies in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. My judgment, revolutionizing our economic system contains, offers no guarantee of bringing our, milita our militarism under control. And the only way we will bring that under control and therefore reduce the imperialist pressures in American life is by having a government intelligent and strong enough to keep the military in their place and to begin the demilitarization of our national life. This process has already begun in a weak but still evident way. The mistrust of the, military, of the Pentagon in the Senate of the United States, for example, is already epidemic. And, but, and along with the quest for racial justice, the demilitarization of our national affairs seems to me the central problem of our politics. Militarism, Woodrow Wilson said, does not consist in the existence of any army. Militarism is a spirit. It is a point of view. It is a system. It is a purpose. The purpose of militarism is to use armies for aggression. Remembering this, we can recall the wise words of George Washington in his farewell address Overgrown military establishments under any form of government are inauspicious to liberty and particularly hostile to Republican liberty. If we proceed in this spirit and with due scorn for the false patriotism of the jingos and the war lovers, we can, bring, bring this, we can begin to bring this country back to a measure of sanity and decency in the conduct of our affairs abroad and in the conduct of our own national life. Thank you. We have, we have ushers in both aisles here with mics, and if you'll raise your hand, they'll bring microphones to you, and you can throw questions at Professor Schlesinger for him to answer. We might wait a minute for those who have to go to classes to leave the room and for me to have a glass of water. Okay, if anyone has questions, exhortations, or complaints, I shall be glad to do as best I can right here. Yes, you spoke about the materialistic, I mean, the, the warrior-like people that might be so powerful in our country and how it's up to the civilian leadership to curb this. Do you think, I'm curious to hear your feelings about the possibility if there were or was a civilian leader who did attempt to somewhat curb this military, that if they, in some way to preserve their own power, might in some way try to eliminate this person? Question, this is, I suppose, we want to call the seven days in May question. <laughs> Whether if a serious attempt were made to curb the military, the military might follow the Greek path and uh, try to remove the president who tried to do so. One hesitates to, particularly in this weird country in which we live, uh, to exclude anything as a possibility. I think that the tradition of, of obedience to civilian authority is deeply ingrained in, in the American military. And I think that the tendency will be if civilian authority is imposed upon them for them to grumble, to complain to the Hill, uh, to leak to the press, 
uh, but and eventually to accept it. The one military leader in this country who might have had the popular appeal to attempt a coup was, I suppose, General MacArthur. And when President Truman fired him in 1951 at a time when President Truman's own political fortunes were low and when General MacArthur had a kind of triumphal return to the United States, uh, the matter, MacArthur accepted it, everyone accepted it, there was a, few, a week or so of indignation and then life went on and eventually Truman became much stronger as a result of that. I noticed that in the Kennedy administration, President Kennedy followed the advice of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, accepted their recommendations on only one important occasion during his term, and that was the Bay of Pigs. And as a consequence of that, uh, it was an expensive way to learn a lesson, uh, but it was a lesson that he learned very clearly. And though thereafter he all, always listened courteously to their recommendations, he did not follow their advice followed their advice neither in the Berlin crisis of 1961 nor in the Laos crisis of 61-62 nor during the Cuban Missile Crisis nor with regard to the Test Ban Treaty nor with regard to any major events. I think one of the great misfortunes of the Johnson administration was that Johnson did believe the generals knew what they were talking about. So we had that curious time when the American people were ex exhorted to listen to, with reverence to General Westmoreland who turns out in retrospect to have been the most disastrous American general since Custer. <laughs> but in any case, I think the odds would be against a military coup d'etat because I believe that the, 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 the way, the, the, what seems to me malign influence the military have had in our national life has been a consequence uh, not so much of the malevolence of their own purpose as it has been of the uh, timidity and incompetence of the civilian leadership. Do you think that uh, President Nixon's Vietnamization program is a viable uh, policy for extricating the United States? And if not, can you suggest an alternative? I think that President Nixon's Vietnamization policy is a fantasy. Uh, and I think it is a policy that far from leading us out of the war is going to get us more deeply involved into the war. President Nixon's policy, as he set it forth on November 3rd, was that the United States will protect the government of South Vietnam until that government is ready to protect itself. On the record, that's going to be a terribly long time. Uh, we've been through these recurrent waves of military optimism with, re with regard to ARVA and the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, with regard to the pacification program, and so on. I see no reason to believe that the current wave of optimism is at a better base than previous waves of optimism. And I think the Vietnamization policy of steadily pursued is going to take us further away from peace. The reason for this is that Nixon administration began uh, with two policies, two riding two horses. One was the horse of Vietnamization. The other was the horse of negotiation. And these two policies, pursued beyond a certain point, become incompatible. Uh, because uh, the policy, uh, they require opposite things. The policy of Vietnamization requires a steady strengthening of the government of South Vietnam. The policy of negotiation requires cutting loose from the Saigon government, as men like Averill Harriman and Clark Clifford have long been urging. Policy of Vietnamization requires the acquiescence in the action of the Saigon regime in protecting, in, in imprisoning, uh, persecuting, and killing leaders of a potential opposition. Uh, the policy of negotiation requires action by the United States to protect leaders of a potential co coalition regime. The Vietnamization policy requires the intensification of the fighting. The negotiation policy requires the slowing down of the fighting. Uh, but worst of all, as I say, is that the Vietnamization policy ties us even more closely to the government in Saigon. And as long as we appear to regard the retention of the Saigon government as a vital interest of the United States and as a necessary result of any negotiation, all negotiations are doomed to failure. So I would, as I believe the Vietnamization course is fantasy, uh, General Tu, in this outrageous press conference he gave the other day, said he would not consent to the removal of the certain number of beyond American troops beyond a certain number from Vietnam by the end of 1970. The Vietnamization policy confers a power of veto uh, on this crowd of military crooks in Saigon over the policy of the United States, and it will not get us out of the war. And I think the way we should get out is the way that people like Averill Harriman 
have recommended, and that is through pursuit of a negotiated settlement, which requires cutting loose from the, from the Saigon government and making a serious attempt at negotiation. Other question. Uh, at the time of his death, uh, there were about 16,000 men in South Vietnam when Kennedy was killed. And I guess as a member of that so-called privileged in-group, what do you think, uh, do you think the United States would have fought a massive land war in Asia if Kennedy had lived? Well, the United States have fought a massive land war in Asia if Kennedy had lived. I've f f forsworn trying to, to guess what presidents who are dead would have done about problems which took new forms after their death. It's hard enough to guess what living presidents are going to do about such problems. I w would say that, that uh, there's also a presumption for anyone to say what John Kennedy would have done. If any people had the right to say so, or it was his brothers. And I would think that the best interpretation of the kind of policy that John Kennedy pursued, uh, would have pursued had he lived, is the kind of policy that Robert Kennedy uh, advocated in, with regard to Vietnam when he was alive. Certainly, the President Kennedy, in his last, one of his last public statements about, South, about Vietnam, kept making a point. He said, it is their war. We can send them economic assistance. We can send arms. We can send our advisors there. But it is their war. Only the people of South Vietnam can win it or lose it. And the great shift, of course, came in 1965 when we Americanized the war and sent our bombers to North Vietnam and our combat units to South Vietnam. And President Johnson started calling it not their war, but our war. And that shift was more than somatic. Paul Kennedy's three years, 67 Americans were killed in South Vietnam, which were fewer than were killed last week, which was described as the lowest week in more than three years. The young lady. I'm sorry, there may be people in the back of the room with the glare is such that I can't see it, so if the ushers would look for hands farther back, I can only see about the first half dozen rows. You mentioned mediocre um, leaders in both Soviet, in, in Russia, and in the United States. One might say that mediocre leaders today in Russia came because of purges of anyone that didn't follow the party line in Russia. Now, you'd have to comment on that, perhaps, but also, do you think the United States has something like that that we don't realize, that sort of purges us of any leaders or any um, stray political groups in the country? They just, you know, kill them or raid them, something like that. I'm not sure whether I exactly got the question. Because whether the mediocrity of Russian leadership is due to purges and whether we aren't having our own system of purges. Well, it certainly can be argued that, that uh, American society has done an enormously effective job in murdering its potentially most effective leaders in the decade of the 60s. I suppose that the difference between a spontaneous purge of the kind undertaken by the Americans and a calculated and organized purge of the kind taken by the uh, Soviet Union is a difference, but the results are disastrous for, for both countries. And clearly, the mediocrity of our present situation in the United States is due in part to that. Yeah. It's a, it's a murder of American leaders' plan. I don't know to what extent individual murders have been planned, but I would doubt very much whether all the political murders in the United States in this decade, up to now including Joe Jockey Oblonsky of the UMW, I would doubt very much whether these are the results of any central plan. Another question. Sir, is there anyone farther back yeah. that the ushers can see? Being from Latin America, I'd like to ask you a question regarding the present activity in your government. Uh, do you think that the uh, United States is reducing the power of the Pentagon? And if so, why does Rockefeller recommend military aid to Latin America, to the dictatorships over there? And also, why do they have installations such as missile in, what, in Panama? And why are they using ba bacteriological weapons in Brazil? The um, power that the Pentagon has if the United States government is trying to reduce the power of the Pentagon in Latin America, why the use of bateriological warfare in Brazil, missile bases in Panama, Rockefeller's recommendation for aid to dictatorships? 
Uh, I think that the I'm not sure that the government is trying to reduce the power of the Pen that this government is trying to reduce the power of the Pentagon in Latin America. I think Nelson Rockefeller's report, though it has some good things in it, was in this regard of very much a document of the of Rockefeller's youth. Rockefeller became a Latin American expert during the Second World War at a time when Latin America was being threatened by an extracontinental power, in this case Germany, is uh, the mold of his mind of thinking about Latin America was apparently set in that period. And though there's it's a different extracontinental threat, he still thinks of this as being a primary problem in Latin America with, with Russia now playing the role that Nazi Germany played in his youth. I think the, uh, that this government has no Latin American policy. It is, obviously very indifferent to Latin America. It's made a few recommendations of a useful sort which might improve the trading positions of uh, Latin American countries, but it's uh, abandoned uh, the interest of the Alliance for Progress in encouraging social change or encouraging political democracy in Latin America. I don't think it will play a very malevolent role in Latin America. Uh, because uh, I think of the general mood of withdrawal and anti-interventionism of, of the United States these days, I don't think it will play much of a role at all. But I think that it will tend to deal with existing governments, no matter even a government like the Duvalier regime in Haiti, even governments as squalid and, and terrible as that. So I don't, I think that the major job of fighting for democracy in Latin America, and the period ahead is going to come, it's going to be a job for the Latin Americans. And I, I think that uh, the United States will not play much of a role on one side or the other. Back there. Uh, what do you think China's role in world politics will be in the future? China's role in world politics. Well, China's role in world politics will probably be determined much more by the history of China than by current ideological conflicts. China has long regarded itself as the center of the world. Its, its feeling of national superiority and racial superiority is even more ineffable than that of the United States. And it's always regarded the rest of the world as barbarians. Uh, within China itself, the fight between the Maoists and the pragmatists will continue, and in, in the long run, I suppose, the very necessities of keeping a society together will give victory more to the technicians and less to the evangelists. But even if uh, people less interested in isolating themselves from the rest of the, rest of the world than the, Mao, than the Mao regime came to power in China, I think China would still tend to pursue an isolationist policy. Uh, its main concern at the moment is Soviet Union, a more a less a fanatical crowd in Peking might be more willing to come to terms with the United States and the outside world in order to provide a power balance of power offset against the Soviet Union. But I would suppose that the uh, China would be so absorbed in its own problems for some time to come that it will not uh, be an aggressive expansionist power so far as, 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 as the world is concerned. And I think what the rest of the world must do is to try to normalize relations with China as rapidly as the Peking regime permits. But since the Peking regime is not presently interested in the normalization of relations, that may take a long time. Back in the middle there, I guess. Uh, do you feel that perhaps the power of the military can be lessened if the draft policy of the United States is changed in such a fashion not to guarantee a military any amount of men that it deems necessary to carry any sort of conflict? Would the power of the military be changed by, uh, be altered, lessened by a change in the draft policy? I don't think so. I think the, it's not really the number of men in the army which which accounts for the effectiveness of the military in, 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 in amending national policy in something like Vietnam. But there, the question of the power of the military does bear upon one question, and that is the various merits of a draft army as against a professional army. 
Uh, someone brought up the possibility of a military coup if a serious effort were made to cut back military power. I would imagine that possibility would be much increased if we had a volunteer army, or in other words, a professional army. I think that the citizen army is a, kind of, is a rather useful thing because it means that large numbers of people uh, pass through the army, and unless the army has changed from the way it was when I was a member of it in the Second World War, uh, most draftees come out of the army with a great conviction of its incompetence, inefficiency, wastefulness, and a great lack of respect for its leadership. And uh, so I think that from the point of view of stopping military coups, that the continuation of the draft system uh, would seem to me much preferable to the establishment of an isolated, professional, full-time, full-life military corps, uh, which would be separated, from, isolated from the currents of civilian life and might be much more likely to be an instrumentality of some effort at dictatorship. Uh, how about right behind you over there? Um, I have two related questions. One, do you think it's desirable for the United States government to promote democracy in the world? Just a second ago, you stated that um, what our policies in Latin America were not promoting democracy, as you saw it, and, and supporting the dictatorships. And two, do you think that our that your advice that we negotiate with communists will promote democracy in Southeast Asia? Question of whether the U.S. should promote democracy in the world. Actually, I didn't use the verb promote democracy in Latin America. I said encourage Latin democracy. And I would, I deliberately chose the word encourage rather than promote. I think there are limits to what the United States can do to promote a democracy anywhere. And it's a great illusion, this illusion of the nation-building illusion, the illusion that we can determine the destiny of other nations. It's an illusion the United States has in Latin America. It's an illusion that many Latin Americans have about Latin America, that the future of their own country is going to be determined by United States policy. If democracy is going to come about in Latin America, it's going to become a, come about as a consequence of the effort and the passion and the conviction and the intelligence of Latin Americans. And, uh, what we can do is not block it, not stand in its way, not finance its opponents. And when I say encourage, what I mean is that Latin American democracies should get preferred treatment. And that this doesn't mean that if there's a dictatorship in Latin America, we should stop recognizing it or penalize it and so on, give that, treat that correctly. But I think that in, in Latin America particularly, that where progressive democratic governments and parties and leaders exist, that we, sh we should make it clear that we regard them as our particular friends. And that is what the Kennedy administration did, and what the Johnson administration stopped doing, and what the Nixon administration has made it very clear it couldn't care less about doing. So I believe we can do things to encourage democracy. There's not very much we can do about promoting it. As for democracy in Southeast Asia, what would the effect would affect a negotiated settlement have? I think that in our sense, democracy is not going to be much of a reality probably for some time in Southeast Asia. Uh, that so far as government that does things for the people, probably the best government in Southeast Asia uh, might conceivably be that of Hanoi if given a chance so far as education, medical care, and that sort of thing is concerned. And I think that we just have to renounce the sense that it's the responsibility of the United States uh, until at least we can do a better job of making democracy real in our own country uh, to try to pronounce the rest of the world. We just don't know enough. We, there are many, it's going to be many situations which develop in the world in the next decade which we will not have the power enough to influence nor the wisdom enough to cure. And since we have messianic mo moods, it's going to be hard to accept the limitation of our role, uh, but it's necessary for us to accept it. This, this will be the last question. Do you think that um, President Nixon has been handed, uh, in effect, a blank check by the American people because he's kind of smoothed over uh, a lot of strong American opinion against the war in Vietnam? And that is assuming that the government of this country is crudely responsive to the desires of the uh, populace. He certainly, since the November 3rd speech, there's been a subsiding of uh, criticism of Nixon's policy. I think it's partly due to the great weariness that people have about the war. It's partly due to the highly publicized, though not very large, troop withdrawals. It's partly due to the sense, the hope that people have, the belief that people have that Nixon really wishes peace, the hope that the Vietnamization policy is the way to get it. 
and it's partly due to the success with which President Nixon has put over the thesis that uh, if his plan works, it will be uh, a result of his wisdom, and if it fails, it will be the res because people dared criticize him publicly and therefore display disunity in the country. I don't believe this mood is going to last very long. For example, one of the great things by which p opinion in Vietnam is determined is the what they read in the newspapers. Now, the great Nixon policy stands or falls on the success of Vietnamization. If Vietnamization doesn't work, uh, then we've practically eliminated the chance of negotiation. And Vietnamization doesn't work, we don't know where the hell we are. Uh, the newspaper men in Vietnam are not permitted uh, to cover the Arvin units, that is the South Vietnamese units. Uh, this is not presently recognized, but this will be pretty soon we'll begin to wonder if Vietnamization is working as well as Nixon says it does. Why don't we uh, read reports about how well the South Vietnamese units are doing? Uh, in other, reg other regards, the consequences of Vietnamization, the re further political repression, the expulsion of people from the Vietnamese assembly, the sending of people to the opposition to jail, the shutting down of newspapers, all these things are going to be, the consequences of the Vietnamization policy are going to become more and more evident. At the same time, unless the benefits become more visible than they are, there will be a new rise of skepticism against the Nixon policy. Personally, I think that the Vietnamization policy is leading us so fast in such a wrong direction and thereby reducing so much the possibilities of a, of a negotiated settlement that the protest against that policy ought to be much stronger and harder than it is. Uh, so I hope that the, particularly that I'm, no one is more against pollution than I am. Uh, but the effort of the administration by congratulating the young people of this country for lose, lose, losing interest in controversial issues like Vietnam and getting interested in splendid non-controversial issues like pollution. This is an obvious diversionary action on the part of the administration. We won't be able to do anything proper or adequate to defend the environment in this country until we get out of this ghastly war. And that is the first priority. And I hope you will all continue doing everything you can to make that point clear to the administration. Thank you.